Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Tech Policy Grind podcast. I am your host, Rima Musa, and I'm joined by the lovely Lama Muhammad as we first dive into the news and then turn it over to the core of today's episode, which is a recap of CyberCon, which is the Foundry's first ever virtual cybersecurity awareness event in celebration of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which is the month of October. So, hey, Lama, hey, what's new? Uh, what's new is I'm learning how to use Mastodon <laughs> because everyone thinks that as a 20-year-old, I know everything and all things social media, even though I'm only exclusively on Tumblr. Um, so that's been what, that's been the, the week for me. What about you? Yeah, I am in travel recovery mode. It's Aww. been a long <laughs> semester of a lot of travel um, to different conferences, which has been a ton of fun. It's been great to meet so many people in mm -hmm. the privacy and cybersecurity space in particular. But last week, I had the pleasure of going to Washington, D.C. for the Privacy and Security Forum hosted at George Washington University by mm -hmm. Professor Daniel Solov and Professor Paul Schwartz. So that's what my past few days have looked like. And now I'm settling back into L.A. and on the study grind. I don't know <laughs> how you do it. Fine. <laughs> we do it we do it we make it work <laughs> for sure for sure uh all right so let's talk about the news uh before we dive in once again full disclaimer that the opinions discussed on this news segment do not reflect the institutions organizations and companies that we are affiliated and work with we are just two young women figuring out the mayhem of the tech policy world. So, Rima, let's get into it. Yeehaw. <laughs> What's top of mind for this week? The FTC, as always. <laughs> <laughs> as always these days. Uh, so the FTC recently brought an action against Chegg, which is an educational tech provider uh, well known for providing resources to students on specific assignments for their professors and whatnot. And Chegg has come under fire from the FTC for lax data security practices that have led to four separate breaches now. And the FTC's proposed settlement order would require the company to bolster its cybersecurity practices and implement data minimization policies, as well as offer multi-factor authentication to users for account security, as well as allowing users to access their data and delete it. Right on. And I think it's interesting because, and I would say it could be a little bit more worrying than how most companies go about their data practices. But according to the FTC, Chegg didn't have a written security policy until January 2021 and sort of failed to provide sufficient security training details for their employees to sort of identify phishing attacks. And that sort of led or could sort of led to, you know, the compromise of data being leaked regarding social security numbers of both their employees and students. And, you know, just some of these more basic cybersecurity practices we weren't seeing, which is a little worrying given, you know, we're in 2022 and some of these basic ideas of multi-factor authentication, not using the same password, Sort of training employees to recognize phishing attacks is sort of almost old news. Yeah, and you bring up two really interesting points that were actually a big part of the conversation at the Privacy and Security Forum uh, that happened last week. And the notion that 
A, the FTC is focusing in on sensitive information, vulnerable communities and populations is really interesting, an interesting pattern to see across uh, the different cases that the FTC is examining. But it's also interesting to see that the FTC is really going after the most abusive or the most sort of extreme cases uh, of data security and privacy violations. Um, you know, Chegg has been breached four times at this point. A lot of the other cases that the FTC is looking at, and this was mentioned time and time again at the conference, they're really kind of just trying to get these companies to do the basics as far as cybersecurity and privacy best practices. So it'll be interesting to see as time goes on if the FTC continues to look at those companies who are doing far less than the minimum or if they will start to get a little bit more aggressive and progressive in the types of companies that they're looking at that might be violative of other uh, laws that have um, much more, uh, you know, substantial obligations. So that's one thing to watch. It's definitely something to watch and definitely we'll be watching to see if this will set a precedent for the rest of the ed tech industry. Well, that brings in the notion of what kids are using these days and feels like TikTok is a huge part of that conversation. So what's going on in the world of TikTok and kids' privacy? So as a fake Gen Zer, I am not on TikTok. I refuse to be on TikTok. <laughs> um, but I know um, many of my siblings' friends are on it, and it's a very popular app among the Gen Z community. And I won't lie. Some of the videos to sort of mobilize, get out the vote have been really have been pretty influential. So that is not to discredit the the influence and great use of TikTok for sort of our generation. Um, but I digress. So this week, members of the U.S. House of Representatives issued letters to Apple and Google questioning their policies regarding TikTok and other apps that could pose privacy threats. Um, the House of Representatives sent a letter to the Google CEO and the Apple CEO sort of questioning if there is sort of a fine line for how apps may or may not be taken off the Google Play Store app stores respectively, if they sort of cross the line of putting Americans at risk to foreign surveillance, especially adversarial actors like China. And so... What I found really interesting about this letter is that it it references research um, by a security expert by the name of Felix Krauss, who I may have totally butchered his last name, um, but I thought this was especially interesting because they bring up the use of potential keystroke logging um, within the TikTok app. And for those who don't know what keystroke logging is... It is a sort of new form of, it's a new form of a cyber threat. And essentially hackers can take your keystroke logs from when you type on your keyboard and sort of decipher your password, any or sort of any other information that's entered onto the keyboard. And that may mean that cyber criminals can figure out your PIN, your account number, your login information for financial, gaming, or online shopping accounts, and, you know, even your personal social media. So what does this mean for 2023? What are your thoughts, Rima? It's going to be fascinating to see how policy around TikTok from the U.S. perspective emerges. It's been a hot topic in the headlines lately as right. far as what sort of data TikTok is collecting, where is that data stored, who has access to it. TBD. And we may see 
how this case may also influence bipartisan bills to come in the next Congress specifically aimed to protect the privacy and online safety of young users, especially because that was sort of a big deal at the beginning of the year. It sort of died down now, but I'd be curious to see what changes in the next year. Absolutely. So before we wrap our little session on the news and get to the bulk of today's episode, let's talk about data scraping. So LinkedIn versus HiQ is a case that has been ongoing for quite a while now, but the news out of these past couple of weeks is that LinkedIn got sort of a semi-win in the case so far Mm -hmm. as far as uh, getting a partial win from U.S. District Judge Edward Chen Mm -hmm. uh, from an October 27th order that ruled that Haikyuu actually breached its, uh, breached LinkedIn's user agreement by directing its Haikyuu's contractors to create fake accounts in order to scrape data from Mm -hmm. LinkedIn. Uh, But still to be decided is whether LinkedIn waived its right to enforce its user agreement since Haikyuu did openly discuss its business model and reliance on uh, data scraping from LinkedIn at industry events that were attended by LinkedIn executives. Um, This is according to a great article on Law 360 from Piper Hoodsbeth Blackburn. Uh, We'll have it linked in the show notes. But really interesting case. A lot of fascinating implications for data scraping as a practice, as a practice that many business models rely on. Mm -hmm. And also will be interesting to see the implications as far as interpretation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is sort of poised as the predominant U.S. anti-hacking law. Mm -hmm. It'll be fascinating to see how this turns out. We will wait and see with an upcoming trial um, on the breach of contract claim that is supposed to begin on February 27th of 2023. So couple more months of this to go, possibly more, depending on uh, how long this gets dragged out. Well, thanks, Lemma, as always, for chatting about the news. And now we'll turn over to today's episode, which you're also involved in, Lemma, uh, in which we chat with our colleagues from the Foundry, Allison McReynolds and Grant Versfeld, on our recent event, uh, CyberCon, which was the Foundry's first ever virtual cybersecurity summit in celebration of Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which was the month of October. Alrighty, I'm here with Allison McReynolds, Lama Muhammad, and Grant Versfeld. Welcome back to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. Excited to be here. Hi, everyone. Hi there. Thanks for having us. Woohoo. So we're going to talk about CyberCon today, which was the first ever half-day cybersecurity summit that the Foundry has done. And it was a ton of fun to collaborate with you all on this event, but I figured it would be great for our listeners to hear a little bit about what went on and some highlights um, before they perhaps decide to check out the recording of the event itself. So just going to jump into it. Allison, starting with you, you kicked off CyberCon with a threat intelligence briefing featuring two of our very own fellows, Ricky George and Sasha Hondagnu-Mesner, as well as Amy D'Souza of 
Southwest Airlines and the Women in Cybersecurity Privacy Law and Policy Affiliate. So what were some highlights of the conversation? Yeah, so we had three really great panelists and they all talked about different things, but they were all connected in one way or another. So first we heard from Ricky, she touched on how a lot of businesses are interconnected through the supply chain and rely on other small and medium sized businesses to function. When you think about supply chain, you know, all of these organizations, the ones I've worked for and currently work for included, have a lot of interconnections with third parties. And those third parties are really a good way into the organization, right? Security is always looked at and has consistently looked at the front door and protecting, you know, the front and back doors, but the side windows that are the supply chain uh, networks that we interact with are a key vulnerability for us. Um, And a lot of organizations rely on similar small and medium-sized businesses. Um, in order to conduct business. Um, And so I think it's really important for us to understand, you know, what are these smaller organizations that are supporting whole industries like the financial sector uh, or the U.S. government or have a global footprint? Um, If you think about solar winds, which of course was, you know, um, big news in the cybersecurity space uh, a little while ago, um, a lot of organizations across government and the private sector were using their uh, software. So software supply chain compromise was a valuable opportunity for adversaries to infiltrate organizations across the world. Um, And I think we're going to see more of that going forward, um, especially as adversaries get more adept at understanding all these smaller organizations that support the larger critical infrastructure, um, not only here in the United States, but also overseas as well. So the smaller organizations that support large sectors and the government can end up having a global impact if their systems are not secure and adversaries can target them to infiltrate their larger business partners or areas of critical infrastructure. Sasha spoke more specifically on public disclosure of security incidents, specifically the SEC's proposed rules on mandatory disclosure of cyber incidents. The issue is that as proposed, the notice requirement does not include an exemption for active investigations by law enforcement, Uh, coordination with intelligence or national security or or compliance with court orders that may restrict the timing uh, of such disclosure. Uh, The SEC does acknowledge the importance uh, of uh, such reporting and such disclosure, and and they acknowledge cooperation with law enforcement. I've asked questions about it, uh, but as drafted, it currently doesn't have that. So publicly disclosing information that law enforcement could use in investigation, it, it could cause unintended consequences Uh, such as revealing sensitive information, uh, which a threat actor could use. The second issue a lot of folks have have spoken about is that the public comments uh, haven't really focused and and, and don't provide an exemption for disclosure where premature disclosure of an incident could cause significant damage to vulnerable businesses or government entities, uh, such as supply chains. Uh, So this could go against the principle of responsible disclosure. Uh, Responsible disclosure entails basically holding off public disclosure until a party has been given sufficient time to patch or remediate the vulnerability or issue. Uh, This is especially important if a company discovers that's been impacted by a zero-day vulnerability, uh, maybe in widely used software or or something that expects a supply chain. If such a company is required by the SEC to publicly report an incident before allowing sufficient time to patch, uh, other companies could be caught unprepared. While bad actors could exploit the vulnerability, they could exploit the vulnerability across that company and many other companies. Uh, So victims of cybersecurity uh, incidents and and breaches, they should really be allowed to focus on mitigating the incident without the additional pressure of of prematurely reporting an incident uh, or exposing themselves to additional risk prior to fully remediating the vulnerability. His remarks emphasize the need to develop disclosure regulations that really strike the balance between informing the public and regulators without jeopardizing a company's ability to mitigate the damage or patch their systems or work with law enforcement to assess threats. And then lastly, Amy highlighted how the motivations of threat actors targeting critical infrastructure are very different from the actors targeting consumer data, the financial sector, those breaches that we hear about all the time in the news. She also talked about the move toward combining operational technology with information technology, which will help businesses work better, but also creates these opportunities for cyber threats targeting critical infrastructure. 
So entities that are combining their operational and information technologies will have to synchronize their cyber strategies when managing both. Uh, until now, um, you know, in like in the supply chain plant or an, or an airport or an energy power plant, the operational technology was kept quite isolated from you know information technology. Uh, so to in order to access anything in the operational space, like at the airport or at the energy plant, uh, you need to be physically there and then uh, get access to the systems. Uh, on the other hand, in information technology, employees can work from home, they can access that information from any devices. In a lot of cases, there's, uh, you know, bring your own device as well. So now that there is a lot of push towards that convergence of operational technology and information technology uh, for this, it's, it's, they're all great purposes. It's for better digital transformation, for better productivity, uh, to get that real time data, to make better decisions, but it will open a lot of floodgates. So if you see most of the attacks, the data related attacks are, either phishing emails that an employee has clicked on a, on a malicious link or compromised login details. Most of them, 80% of the time, it's, that is the reason. Uh, now imagine a case that an employee has clicked on, an, on a malicious link that shuts down an entire plant. The convergence of information technology and operation technology uh, uh, could bring those kind of risks to all of the critical infrastructure. So lots of different topics discussed. Thank you so much for that overview. Between all these industries that the panelists covered, what stood out to you as sort of a unifying theme between all, all their briefings? I think Ricky really summed it up nicely at the end of her remarks. She said that cyber threats are busy and addressing them will require partnership among various stakeholders all three of our panelists really emphasized the need for public-private partnerships and that those will be key in responding to mediating and preventing attacks. Thanks, Allison. Grant, you hosted the next session with Josephine Wolf of the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Want to give us an overview of how that discussion went? Absolutely. Josephine spoke with me about her new book called Cyber Insurance Policy, Rethinking Risk in an Age of Ransomware, Computer Fraud, Data Breaches, and Cyber Attacks. In our discussion, she detailed the history and evolution of the cyber risk insurance industry. And she also explained some of the limitations that large organizations face when seeking insurance against cyber risk. And also we dove into some of the drawbacks of the various approaches that both insurers and organizations have when thinking about current cyber insurance policies. That's really interesting. What are some of the main challenges that organizations face when thinking about cyber insurance? The core challenges that came up during our discussion that Josephine identified regarded the frequency of cyber incidents when compared to other types of catastrophes. So think about things like floods, car accidents, someone breaking into your home or business, events like that. And so when people start thinking about data breaches and cyber attacks and ransomware and all these kinds of things as a form of expensive risk, one of the questions that kind of naturally comes up is, well, can we deal with this the same way we deal with other types of risks? Also, cyber incidents can be unique because of the scale of harm that they can potentially have, both in terms of how many people are affected by the incident but also how many people are affected outside of just one organization or area. That's the place where there's kind of the most pressure on policymakers and governments right now, because what you're scared of or what insurers are scared of there is just kind of the scale of damage. How do we pay for a cyber attack that takes out the entire electric grid, a cyber attack that sort of shuts down so many companies and, and has such extraordinary costs that there's no way to kind of do that and, and not go bankrupt. 
Are there any takeaways that come to mind when thinking about the future of cyber insurance? Yes, uh, particularly around the way that we gather data that relates to events that lead to cyber insurance claims. Josephine talked about how a lot of insurers are currently trying to figure out how they can build metrics to create a consensus about what defines the threshold of an incident covered under cyber insurance. I think for cybersecurity, there were kind of a couple pieces that people, myself included, have felt have been missing for a long time. And one is the empirical data about which of the various security controls and countermeasures we have are most effective, right? So if you think about sort of fire insurance, car insurance, we have, we have pretty good consensus on like, here are the things you need to do for car safety. Here are the things you need to do for fire safety. Um, we, don't, we don't have as much of that around cybersecurity. We were talking about the NotPetya case, which was a major ransomware attack that had pretty significant implications for the ransomware industry. I think one of the reasons that the insurers decide to challenge the NotPetya claims is they feel they have a really solid attribution there. And the reason they feel that is because there are, you know, a dozen different governments in February of 2018, including the United States, but many others as well, that kind of come out and make formal statements saying the Russian military was behind NotPetya. And so I think the insurers looked at that and they were like, okay, well, at least we're not going to have to fight the, the attribution battle here because we have more evidence that this was a, a nation state than we have for you know, any other cyber attack in the world. Josephine's remarks were particularly interesting on that regard, because recently, since our discussion, on November 4th, there was a major breakthrough in that case. And it was found that the organizations who were trying to claim against the cyber insurance would be allowed to make those claims, even with the act of war exclusions that normally exist on cyber insurance policies. So we still have a bit more of appeals to go in that case, but her remarks came at a very good time for the future of the cyber insurance industry and the way that we think about how these attacks matter. That's fascinating. Thank you so much for diving into that, Grant. Absolutely. Now switching gears, our next session was cyber hygiene for the legal profession with Cassie Burns, who is a senior e-discovery attorney at King & Spalding, as well as a board member for the Women in Cybersecurity, Privacy Law and Policy affiliate. And she gave some really interesting takeaways on the importance of cybersecurity best practices for not just cybersecurity attorneys, but really every attorney. You may have attorneys that have been practicing for a long time that don't even think about the fact of if I'm sending my client's data, it's not my data, it's my client's data, I should make sure it's password protected or I should make sure it's encrypted or maybe I should send it in email or maybe I should send it in FTP. Really, I think what we can encourage, you know, as people in the cybersecurity space is, you know, creating those mechanisms of, of education with our peers of we're not just talking about, you know, the client's PII out there. We're also talking about like how we're engaging with our clients, how we're engaging with each other, how we're engaging on our own devices. Those are all really important things. And last but not least, our session closed out with a discussion with Eva Galperin of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Sienna Anstis of Citizen Lab. Lama, you did a great job hosting this session, which really broached the intersections of domestic violence and cybersecurity awareness. And the month of October happens to be a month of awareness for both uh, subjects. So what was your vision behind the discussion? Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. So when people think of cybersecurity, they tend to envision a hacker in a black hoodie or a video scrolling through lines upon lines of green code. But this is a very terrible trope and quite an accurate representation of cybersecurity as both a field and profession. Cybersecurity unfortunately now has evolved into something that has real physical consequences impacting thousands of people outside of just stealing money and preventing access to a computer. Scarily, malicious actors have become so sophisticated in how they execute threats that a cyber attack now has the ability to bring real physical harm. Whether that is through a ransomware attack on a hospital and a critical patient misses an important procedure because their file was deleted, or an activist's life is in real danger because they're being watched, tracked, and followed 
their laptop or phone via spyware without even realizing that the spyware is on their device. So spyware is a form of malware, so malicious software. Um, that when installed on your device gives the operator full access to anything on the targeted device. Some people call it a spy in your pocket. Um, so this includes access to the contents of applications that use end-to-end -end encryption like Signal or WhatsApp because the operator is viewing messages sitting decrypted on your phone, um, the ability to activate the microphone and camera on your phone, access and potentially modify or add files on your device, access things you've jotted down in notes, full access. Um, it allows the operator to track your location, and it may, in some cases, allow the operator to access um, and send and post messages, for example, from your, um, from your cloud accounts, giving them the power to potentially impersonate you. So it's quite a wide-ranging set of capabilities. Um, the installation of spyware in the targeted device uh, can take place through three different means. I'm sure people are curious like how this works. I'm not a tech, I'm not a technologist or computer scientist, so I'll give you the, the very basics. Um, one click exploits are where the targeted victim uh, has to actually click or the targeted individual has to actually click on a malicious link or open a malicious file to start the spyware to download to their device. So these links tend to be socially engineered to tempt the target to click on them. For example, if you were to send me an invite to this conference on my phone, perhaps I would be tempted to click on it. Um, zero click exploits are where the targeted victim doesn't have to do anything for the spyware to be installed in their phone at all. So in other words, you don't receive a suspicious link or message and click on it. The spyware is just silently and remotely installed from any around, anywhere around the world in your phone. And we've at the Citizen Lab, um, researchers have seen uh, increasing cases of this type of installation method. And then a third option is manual installation. So for example, you were stopped at the border, they took your phone for a bit, came back. That might be an opportunity to install um, spyware. Uh, so stuffware is uh, the entire class of, uh, of applications that are sold commercially and are meant to be covertly installed on a device, so a tablet, computer, or phone, uh, in order to exfiltrate uh, that data uh, to, a, uh, to a third party. And uh, often, this, uh, this kind of software is, uh, is very easy to find. And uh, it is sold as a way of, you know, track your your you know, uh, your teenager or your cheating spouse or something along those lines. Uh, and it essentially is a, a, a fine way of enabling stalking. So really being able to mitigate these harms is what makes cybersecurity such an important profession and truly, in my opinion, a public service, particularly for vulnerable populations such as you know, tribal groups, uh, local government, nonprofits, uh, low-income communities, the LGBT community, the privacy of Black activists, and the like. This notion was truly my inspiration for my cyber concession with Sienna and Eva, especially because they work with victims of spyware and stalkerware. Uh, the sort of blind spots that um that the cybersecurity profession, that the info information security community has to uh, domestic abuse as a uh, as a threat model. Uh, they often don't think of the abuser from as coming from inside the home. Uh, this is often something that you also see with uh, spyware meant to spy on children and uh, with the setup of uh, sort of uh, home-based uh, automation and Internet of Things devices. Uh, the assumption is that if you live with someone, uh, that they're spying on you is fine, that it is fully consensual, that they should totally know what you're doing. Uh, and your trust in this person is, uh, is never going to change. You're never going to need to lock them out. They're never going to keep their, uh, um, you know, their, their logins long after the, they should have gone. Uh, and uh, this is a, a very big problem. Uh, uh, that we see over and over again. And it's not just limited to stalkerware. Uh, stalkerware gets brought up in the context of, uh, of domestic abuse uh, the most often because it is so powerful and scary and it feels like there are no defenses against it. Um, but the most common sort of abuse that I see in, uh, in, in these relationships is, uh, is almost always uh, account compromise. I, if if there is is something with a login, I have seen it compromised. 
Cybersecurity is also a very interdisciplinary field. It touches on everything from businesses best practices to social justice. And it's really important that we work to change these misconceptions of cybersecurity through conventions like CyberCon. And I was really happy and actually very honored to have been part of that change through our keynote address. Thanks, Lama. And yeah, it was a fascinating session. And I think especially the intersection of domestic violence and cybersecurity Mm -hmm. as sort of the real life implications of this work that we're doing in the tech policy space uh, was so important. So thank you so much. Well, team, it was great collaborating with you all on our first ever CyberCon. And if you're listening, be sure to check it out. The recording is available on the Foundry's LinkedIn page, as well as YouTube. Always a pleasure being here, Rima. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks again, Rima. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Tech Policy Grind. I'm Rima Musa, and I'm the producer, host, and editor of the show, and really glad that you could join us. Huge thank you to Lama Muhammad, our social coordinator, and Allison McReynolds, our accessibility coordinator, for all their help in making this show possible, as well as our whole team over at the Internet Law and Policy Foundry.